morning and welcome to our service of worship on this the second Sunday in Lent. Alan will have explained last week that he has chosen to focus on the Passion Parables during the season of Lent. The one parable he didn't choose was the parable of the wicked tenants. I thought long and hard about whether to go in a different direction and tackle something more familiar for me and also probably with it more within my comfort zone. But after much thought and reflection, I decided to challenge myself knowing that God would help me through the preparation. So that's a bit of background because as you know, Alan's on holiday this week. Before we begin, a few notices to draw your attention to within the order of service. Um, on this coming Friday, the 1st of March, Leave and Mouth Churches Together have organised the World Day of Prayer service in West Weems Church starting at 2 o'clock and there is a warm welcome extended to everyone. And a reminder to elders that after next week's service of worship, you're being asked to stay back for a short session meeting to discuss the arrangements for services, which will take place during Holy Week and Easter Sunday. So if you notice there's an elder not here today, could you give them a gentle reminder? Um, Something that's not in the order of service, but I would like to bring your attention to is um, as a way of helping others and passing on our goodwill, Session have agreed to hold a retiral offering for the two Sundays before Easter Sunday. If you can give, then please do so. And all monies raised will be going to the Hope Chest, which is a charity which supports individuals and families across the Leave and Mouth area with household goods. The theme for this morning's worship is the God of Second Chances. None of us has to feel that our bed is made and that we have to lie in it. If we take a wrong turning in life, and are willing to do what it takes to get back on the right path, then God is there to help and guide us. As the hymn, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God, which is based on Matthew 6, verse 33, tells us, we must first knock on the door to enable the second chance to happen. If we do, God will open that door and let us into his kingdom. So our first hymn this morning is thought to have been published around 1875, almost 150 years ago. But the, ly the lyrics are as relevant today as they were when the writer Fanny Crosby wrote them. The hymn is a joyous redemption hymn, reminding us what God has done for all of us through the gift of his son. We should sing the hymn with real joy and thankfulness, so please stand if you are able and join together in praise by singing 512 to God be the glory, hymn 512.
Let us come together in our prayer of adoration and confession. Let us pray. God of redemption, we come today to give thanks for the ch second chance you offer to all who are willing to see the error of their ways and knock on your door to seek forgiveness and the opportunity to have a closer relationship with you for eternity. God of wonder, thank you for the beauty of your creation and for the resources that are provided to make our life more comfortable. For the fresh, clean water that comes from our taps, unlike many across the globe who have no such access. For the clean air we breathe in day by day, unlike many whose air is so polluted it makes them ill. For the natural surroundings we have on our doorstep, which benefits our health and well-being so much, unlike others who live in concrete jungles or in areas destroyed by over-industrialization and commercialism. God of forgiveness, help us to recognize when we fall short of what we are capable of, for the poor choices we may make when we put our desires and wants before what is right. All you ask of us is that when we make a mistake that we reflect on it and make amends for any hurt we have consciously or unconsciously inflicted. God of second chances, support us as we strive to make better choices in order that we can be closer to you. Help us to grasp that second chance if we have not already done so and seize the opportunities that come our way. Help us to show others who may still be wavering what a positive difference being in a relationship with you makes to our lives. And God of eternity, thank you, gracious God, that this redemption is ours, this new life ready for us to take up and that your voice will guide us on the way. We now join with Christians from across the world as we share the prayer your son taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is another old one written by Isaac Watts, who lived in the latter part of the 17th century through to the middle of the 18th century. Whilst life for us now is different in so many ways, the same truth still applies. Jesus will reign over everyone across the globe and we can all join in praise together. A focus today should be on verse 3, where the writer says that the prisoner can leap and lose their chains. I see the prisoner as someone who is stuck in their old life, making poor choices. But seeing there is a different way is able to seize that second chance God is offering. So please, let's join together in praising the God of second chances and singing hymn 470, Jesus Shall Reign Where Air the Sun, hymn 470.
Our scripture readings this morning will be read to us by Peter and Mary. Psalm 86, verse 5 to 13. This can be found on page 555 of the Old Testament part of the Bible. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to reveal your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Our second reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46, and this can be found on page 22 of the New Testament part of the Bible. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you ever read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Thank you to both Peter and Mary for these readings this morning. When planning a service, what takes me the longest to determine is which hymns will be sung to enable them to thread through the theme of the service. I not only read through the words, to see if they can bring meaning to the theme, I also like to find out about what is the meaning or the history behind its conception. What I found out, out, what I found out about our next hymn was that the writer became involved in a debate caused by the teachings of a man called John William Colenso, whose Zulu converts encouraged him to question the legitimacy of the first five books of the Old Testament. It caused a schism in the Church of South Africa at the time and lots of debate within the wider Anglican Church in England. 
The author, Samuel John Stone, felt the need to remind Christians of the time that the church is not merely an institution built by humans, but more importantly, is a spiritual body designed by God. The writer speaks of the completeness of being in union with God and Jesus and what it can achieve. He also refers to the church as she. He gives the church an identity. It is not a building, but a life in itself. And we all have a responsibility to keep that life going. By grabbing the second chance we are offered, we can be part of the growth of the church, both locally and further afield. So let us join together in making that commitment to be part of the journey of growth of the church by singing hymn 739, the church's one foundation, hymn 739. Let us pray. As we come before you, Lord, may the words we hear this morning speak to our hearts and propel us into building upon our second chance in life. Amen. The parable read to us this morning by Mary is set within the time that Jesus had been teaching in the temple and had annoyed the temple leaders by stopping them taking control of the dialogue. At this time, he tells two parables, the first one being about the son where, sorry, about two sons, where one, after much deliberation, obeyed their father. But the other said he would do his father's bidding but then he chose not to. Jesus was telling them that it is not enough to say you will follow the rules and then go your own way. It is better to be like the first son who after much reflection knows by obeying his father, life in the long run will be more fulfilling. To rub salt in the wounds, of the religious leaders, Jesus then goes on to tell them the parable of what is often referred to as the parable of the wicked tenants. Now, Jesus knows by this point, his time on earth is coming to an end. And he knows it is important to get across what needs to be said as best as he can to give everyone the best chance of taking the right path. He is giving everyone the chance of redemption. The religious leaders of the time saw themselves as the guardian of the rules, and these rules benefited them, getting the grand share of what was good in life. During their time, if there was no heir apparent, if a landlord died, they were then able to reap the benefits from that land. And it is in that context that the parable was told. Now, the way, in my humble opinion, I, I understand the landlord to be God. He has put the care of his land and all that can bear fruit from it with tenants. He controls from afar and gathers a share of the bounty at harvest time. The tenants are not too keen on giving over what is due to the landlord, even when he was the one who initially provided what was required in order for them to succeed. The tenants became greedy and wanted more for themselves. They were selfish, greedy, materialistic, and would do what was needed for them to keep more than their share. Do we, you, know people like that? Are we or you occasionally like that? Now, if you 
are a parent or have been around young children in any capacity, you will recognise some of these traits of being greedy or selfish. But young children don't know any different because they are at a developmental stage in their lives and they are very egocentric. I, or we, my husband and I, have the absolute pleasure of having two young granddaughters who bring huge joy to the lives of many. And they do, when they see one another, mostly get on well. But ask them to let the other play with a new toy first. The tears can appear. At Christmas, we had bought Ella, who some of you have met, and she's three, a little vet station, as she loves animals and has decided already at the age of three and a half that she's going to be a vet when she is an adult. And indeed, when she and I walk along Jury Street, she's always wanting to know what the vet is up to. Ella was so focused on some of her other gifts that she hadn't yet played with the vet station. So her younger cousin, Sophia, who is two, coming on two and a half, went to explore it. Now, as soon as Ella saw Sophia playing with what she saw as hers, she got up and said, but that's mine. I explained it is good to share and take turns as she had lots of other things to explore from what she had received. And at Christmas, it was a huge bounty. Even although Ella is only three, she took on board what was being said and was able to move on and share. Well, were the tenants able to be less egocentric in their situation and move on? Unfortunately, they were not. They decided that they were not going to pay what was due and injured or killed those who came to collect the owner's share, the servants. The owner, not wanting to give in and still wanted to see his vineyard growing, decided to give the tenants another chance and sent a larger group to collect his dues, but they, offer, they ended up in the same state as the first group of servants. Now, my understanding of this parable is that the servants of the landlord represented the prophets from the Old Testament that God had sent to his people, but the people had rejected many of the prophets and what they were saying. Again, not wanting to give in, the landlord thought that by sending his son, the tenants would obey the rules and pay what was due. And again, as I explained, the context here is that the tenants knew the rules of the time were that if there was no heir to the land, then when the landowner dies, they would get the land. And so they killed the son, so there would be no heir apparent. Now, I'm sure we all recognize that Jesus was talking about himself here. He knew and accepted that he was going to be put to death fairly soon. What he then goes on to say is that the parable, sorry, in the parable, is that the landlord, despite all that has happened, wants the vineyard to flourish and continue to bear fruit. So he casts out the original servants and puts, casts out original tenants and puts in new tenants who are willing to follow the rules set by the landlord and put in the work necessary to reap the harvest and gain a good living from their share of the profits. It is at this point that the religious re leaders realize this parable is about them and they are represented as the old tenants. They are incredibly angry because they know they have been found out 
and it reflects badly upon them. But what they don't do is take the time to reflect and learn from the parable and seize their chance for redemption. Jesus is telling them there is now going to be a new order. Anyone can, who lives by the rules, seize that second chance and then be able to be a tenant. So what does it take to be a good tenant? Now, for those of us who have ever been a tenant, and my guess is that everybody here this morning has been a tenant, although you didn't have to pay rent because you were living with your parents. But you probably had to pay some rent by doing some chores. I know I certainly did when I was growing up, and I know my three sons had chores to do. But anyway, perhaps you've been a tenant somewhere else while you were a student, as a lodger, or in social housing. And you'll know that you have to sign a tenancy agreement and you quite often have to have a guarantor who states they will pay the rent if the tenant defaults. Now, as a student in a house I shared with three others, we had to ensure we could pay the bills and that the house was kept in good order, as the letting agent would notify us with very little notice that they were coming round to inspect the property. there was a list of things that we were not permitted to use, including a room in the house, as previous tenants had stripped their motorbike on top of the dining room table and had left marks that could not be removed. We as tenants, the four of us, had to make sure we looked after the goods that had been provided to make our stay more comfortable. It would have been wrong to take advantage of the situation and not obey the rules. We made up a cleaning rota for shared areas of the house and we even made sure that the windows were washed inside and out every week. Oh, to be as house proud now. I don't wash my windows every week. Now, what I'm trying to say is the owner provided us with a set of instructions that had to be followed. We signed up saying we would abide by them and our parents had to countersign ensuring that the bills were paid and that any damage would be repaired. Now, as a parent, I have also been a guarantor and had to make sure that at the end, the accommodation was spick and span. And oh boy, did I scrub those student flats to an inch of their lives. I made a promise and I stuck to it. Now, everyone here, we are all tenants within God's kingdom. Are we ensuring that the kingdom continues to bear fruit? Do we know what the rules are and where to find them? Do we check in with the owner from time to time? and check what it is he wants us to do? Do we share with him when we might have got things a bit wrong and seek his forgiveness and understanding? In the part of Psalm 86 that Peter read to us this morning, we are reminded, as were the religious leaders of the time, that God is forgiving and good. He is a listening God and he will teach us the way in which we should go if we are willing to listen. Are you seizing that second chance that God is offering you? He has seen his son die at the hands of the selfish, greedy, and materialistic. He wants a world where we look after the resources we have, that we look after one another, and especially the most vulnerable in our society. He wants us to be humble and true to his teaching. Let's seize that opportunity to be the person he believes we can be. 
Let others see him through us, and that will will see us, and that we'll endure, that the tree will bear fruit, and the harvest will continue to be a healthy one. Amen. Our penultimate hymn needs little introduction. The words speak for themselves. God was prepared to sacrifice his son so that we could have a second chance, a chance to redeem ourselves. So let's join together in singing hymn 549, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And as soon as we've sung the hymn, We will remain standing, if you're able, to dedicate our offering. But first, hymn 549. prayer for ourselves and others this morning there will be a brief pause after each section allowing you to even individually remember those in need that you may know so let us pray god of mercy and compassion we pray for those in leadership that they may bless the life and peace of the nations our common life here and especially the lives of the poor. We pray the hungry might be fed in body, mind and spirit, that the thirsty be satisfied, that you will hear the cry of those who long for justice. We pray for those we meet each day at work, or in the street, online, or in person, at home, or on the phone. We pray for those who teach in university, college, school, or nursery, in church and community, praying that knowledge may be built up and not puff up and that wisdom might guide the feet of all who walk our world. We pray for those with prophetic gifting, 
that they hear rightly and share rightly and that they have a wise community to assess what they say. We pray for the ministers, deacons, parish assistants and elders of our church and area that they may serve with unity, with love and with joy. We pray for one another that we grow up in faith during this period of Lent, that we renew our hope, that we open our hearts to the deep love of you. We pray for ourselves and our family, that we make time to care for one another, that we make sure we have a good balance in our lives, ensuring we take time for work, rest and play that we take time to listen to you and what you need us to do we leave our prayers with you lord knowing that you have heard each of us here this morning amen our final praise our hymn of praise this morning some people see as a sad hymn but to me, it speaks of the wonderful grace shown by God. Despite our failings, we are never condemned as being beyond hope or to be ridiculed. The grace spoken about is that second chance we are given if we are prepared to look for and accept it. So let's rejoice together in singing the hymn that assures us of God's grace. Hymn 555, Amazing Grace. Hymn 555. Five. Let us join together in sharing a poem entitled Second Chances by Gertrude Jeffries, who has written many Christian poems, probably some of them which are familiar to you, but you didn't know she had written them. So let's join together. Chains can be broken, I know this to be true, and lives can change, be rearranged, all things can be new. Hearts can be mended and pains can fade away, for tears will cease, give way to peace, as life brings a new day. Doors can be opened, new chances come again. We can walk through and start anew, turn sorrow into gain. 
and let's close in praise, prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for loving us despite our many stumbles and failings. Please forgive our missteps and guide us as we seek to serve you wholeheartedly. Lord, please help us to be faithful followers of Christ. Help us never to be ashamed to live our lives according to your commands. We long to be more like you. Please mold us more into your likeness every day. Thank you for your love and faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name.